It's going to be in English as always, and we have one English speaking person, so English. <laughs> um, today we're going to be talking about the naked truth <laughs> about DLT, but before that I'm going to start with some of the hi highlights from the previous month, hopefully, if this works. It was working before. Ah, there we go. So the headlines. We asked people in the group, what are the headlines? And these are the top three. And as you can see, the biggest news, news in June is Libra. And Libra is really quite, yeah, a large announcement. Some people compare it to the biggest thing that has ever happened to money after Bitcoin. Um, so this will be the, the primary thing that I'm going to focus on. And the next two things, I don't think that super like important, but I have uh, I'll say a few words on those as well. Actually, about Libra, it will be very interesting if we start a little bit of a discussion on that, because I mean most of the information is out, so I'm pretty sure you know this information that I'm going to be presenting. But nonetheless, for the video, I have prepared some yeah highlights, and actually this is just the first slide. I have a, a few more slides, <laughs> not that not that much uh, text on those though. So, as you know, there's a white paper, and this white paper, uh, like, it was shared by Facebook. Um, it's, it's about Libra, which is uh, supposedly a cryptocurrency, but, I mean, what is a definition of cryptocurrency? It's uh, like a very, um, it's a bit of a problematic issue, because they really call it on their website as a cryptocurrency, but is it really a cryptocurrency? Isn't, aren't cryptocurrencies supposed to be uh, decentralized, and so on, and what is decentralization? So we can go into very like philosophical debates about whether uh, Libra is a cryptocurrency, if it's decentralized, what does it mean to be decentralized, but I'm not going to go into that. Um, it's definitely a noteworthy project, um, so it's, uh, it's Libra, the, cri the cryptocurrency, and Facebook have also created another uh, legal entity, which is Calibra, which will be taking care of the, the wallets that manage the Libra currency. And those wallets should be available for WhatsApp and Facebook um, sometime into 2020. Um, some people compare clip uh, Libra to basically an infrastructure, a new financial infrastructure that is um, a competitor to the existing one, um, something that Bitcoin was supposed to be, or the, or the, or the decentralized ecosystem was supposed to be. Um, but it's actually a cryptographically authenticated database, uh, which manages the cryptocurrency called Libra. Uh, it's, as far as I'm, I know, it's just, there's just a test net. The main net will launch 2020 sometime. And it's not really clear, I mean, which countries will support, like, for example, will Bulgaria, if, if you're a Facebook user, will you have access to the Libra coins or in your Facebook account? I mean, for me, this is not really clear. The interesting thing is that it's not pegged to the, to, to the US dollar, as, for example, Tether is, which is also a stable coin, and Libra is also a stable coin. Its value does not fluctuate but it will be packed to a basket of, of currencies, of government, like national currencies. Um, I couldn't find information about the actual, like which currencies exactly will be used. There are just suggestions which, which might be used. And these are some of those. Um, and the Libra Association is established. And that was actually the big news. 28 members, founding members in the Libra Association, very big names inside. Um, you can see some of the big names. We have Lyft, we have Uber, eBay, PayPal, and MasterCard. So a lot of a lot of big players. Um, and what is the Libra Association doing? Actually, the Libra Association, it's like Facebook. I, I think you can see Facebook here. You see, like fa Facebook is just a part of the association. So everybody thinks it's a, like it, it's. It's a Facebook pro project, but Facebook actually tries to convince everybody that it's not really a Facebook project. Yes, Facebook is kind of launching it, and um, yeah, the, the, the primary company behind it, but they are, but they're just part of this um, association. 
yes. And what is the association going to do? It's, uh, of course, registered in Switzerland. And it's going to have three primary functions. And these are the three primary functions. So basically, overall governance of, of the whole association. Uh, then they will keep, the association will be taking care of, the, of this basket of currencies, uh, which um, actually create the value, the intrinsic, the intrinsic value for the Libra coin. So one Libra coin should be equal to one, uh, one of these baskets. So one, I don't know how to call it, one, lib, one currency of these baskets. And the, the association will be, will be managing that. Uh, backing the digital currency. So the idea is more or less as, as like t Tether. You have one digital currency which in equals one US dollar in the case of Tether. In the case of Libra, you have one Libra that will equal one of this basket of national cryptocurrencies. And then uh, Libra, the Libra Association will be taking... No, currencies. Currencies. Yeah. Um, that's interesting because uh, I, in time, maybe this could change to also include Bitcoin, uh, nobody knows, or gold. And that's what's going to like, very, be very interesting, but what's going to happen, you don't know, and we, we don't know. Um, and then it's considered an open source project also. So you have, the, you have the testnet running, and you have the open source code there, I guess, related to the, to the testnet. Um, and at some point, they want to make it even more decentralized and so on, but it's not really clear when this is going to happen and how it's going to happen exactly. Um, but the association will be managing the, the technology roadmap. And the primary message, and if you have seen the video, is about the banking the unbanked, which is kind of also the message of, yeah, cryptocurrencies. Um, and basically including that part of uh, the humanity which doesn't have any access to, to, um, to banking services uh, and to, to cheap also remittance. And yeah, as I said, they are creating something a, as a, um, like a new financial infrastructure. They are not trying to build on the existing one, which is banks, financial inst institutions, central banks. They're basically creating a new financial inst institution and are becoming something like a central bank, which is very, very interesting because this is the first time when like, technological companies actually are trying to create their own cryptocurrency. And actually, Facebook could be the first one and they will, of course, have the first mover advantage of that. But then maybe Google would like to, like, might, might think it's a good idea, or I don't know, Tesla or any of the big, big tech companies might also think that it's a good idea to create that. But the whole thing with regulators is very interesting to see how it's going to develop. And yeah, this is the, again, the, the 28 founding members. And see Spotify also is there. So. Yes, I don't know exactly what, how exactly Spotify will make use of it, but um, I guess at the very least they could be running a node. And running a node is $10 million. If you have $10 million, you can, maybe it's not that easy actually, because if I have $10 million and go to Facebook and tell them I would like to become a, a member of also your association, I don't think that they will accept me. So it's kind of a, like an elite club of companies, I would say. Uh, and so you, you, you might have the privilege to give, to spend $10 million to become a associate member or, or a member of the association. So, uh, but it, I see a lot of, like in a lot of articles say that $10 million is nothing in comparison to what a node operator on the Libra network can make in terms of processing fees and also uh, by the fact that they're going to be holding a large amount of money of like the user's actual currencies and they're going to be getting the interest on that. Uh, an interesting point here is that it's not very clear at this point because there are no financial institutions here who is going to be actually storing this like all these money that should be that should back the Libra cryptocurrency. So there is no custodian yet chosen, but I'm pretty sure that there will be uh, at least one company on a global scale that will be interested to do that service. But I think it, one will not be enough. 
the, the interesting thing is that this association should grow to 100 members, so 100 nodes. And if you're, if you're running a node, it will be in your best interest to, um, to actually, for example, if you're in Bulgaria and you're running a node, it's in your best interest to, to, to do the, like the, the required, to take the required actions to convince the Bulgarian government which most probably will not be very happy with Libra, I don't know, uh, that Libra is fine and it should be here, like should be functioning here uh, uh, between like in the, in the borders of, of Bulgaria. So it's very interesting because it, through this association, they're kind of decentralizing the process of getting um, like regulatory approval in, in the 195 countries that, that exist in the world. So it's not Facebook against the world, but all of the association's members uh, against the governments of the world, so to say. Um, which is very interesting. And it's like a, it's basically some kind of decentralization. You are decentralizing the regulatory effort required to make this a reality, which is a, which is a very, it's a, it's a smart move, I would say. And I've taken, I, I've taken these conclusions, there are a lot of conclusions, from um, a post that was shared in the group by Boris. He did a very interesting analysis of, of, of Libra. And yes, it starts with this. The era of supranational currencies has arrived, um, which, is, which is very interesting uh, because so far there is no, like, there hasn't been any currency well, maybe if you consider gold, gold a currency, but apart from that, no digital currency, apart from also Bitcoin, that, uh, that, has exist, that exists today. So it's a, it's a major move on the part of corporations. And it's a very, it's a, it should be very worrying for the existing financial, uh, financial system, or financial order, because it creates for the first time a, a real competitor who knows what's, what, what they're doing in the face of uh, Facebook. And it's not, for example, Bitcoin, which is decentralized, it's immutable and um, like censorship, censorship in, uh, resistant, but uh, is not yet that close to the masses as Libra can be, having in mind that Facebook has his huge network effect of more than 2 billion users worldwide. And Central banks and governments already said that they're not very happy with it and they need to learn more. Uh, some of the messages that I have read kind of read like, we're gonna try to kill it with regulation. But we'll see if this is going to be possible um, and in which countries actually. And the, the dark side of this is of course the fact that if Facebook, which has access to all your photos and whatever you're doing, it has so much information about you, now has also information about what you're spending money on, on a daily basis, uh, who you're sending money to. Um, I mean, this is kind of becoming something like a dystopia, uh, like one global corporation uh, basically setting the rhythm of the life of billions of people uh, worldwide and having access to the services that this, this one corporation has could be essential for modern life. And <laughs> this is a bit scary. And that's why I think cryptocurrencies are not the ones that are very, uh, like really negatively affected by this. Uh, if you see the price of Bitcoin, Libra is, is definitely could be a factor to the increase. Uh, because cryptocurrencies actually are trying to avoid something like this happening. Uh, Facebook, of course, is saying that Facebook and Libra are completely different entities, but having in mind how much KYC and AML you need to go through, you will most, need, most probably need to go through, um, it's, I, it's very hard to believe that they're not going to be connected in some way. Um, but let's see what's going to happen. And yes, what Bitcoin is doing to gold as store of value, Libra can do to central banks and financial institutions and all yeah, yeah, payments and transactions of money worldwide. So it's, it's very interesting uh, what's going to happen. Um, I think, yes, I already mentioned that we can all grab the popcorn and, and sit down for the show like to see like the fight between corporations and governments that is going to ensue 
Actually, he's already ensued, but he already started. But it's going to be like continue, especially when uh, Libra is a reality, becomes a reality. And two final quotes on this point. Um, there's another article that I wrote, that I read, and this was one. Yeah, po point. It's like everything. Like if, if you if if you have been into crypto, in you in you see Libra and how governments are immediately reacting to it. It's really something that Bitcoin was supposed to do. Uh, it kind of kind of did it to a, to a certain extent, but it so far hasn't really gotten the 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 uh, network effect to actually do this. Uh, especially in the, in the case of payments, because payments in Bitcoin are not that common. Usually, it's used as really a store of value and and gold. Nobody is sp spending money. Like if you if you guys spent money like in Bitcoin two weeks ago, you would have been very sad now, like very sad. So if you have bought anything in Bitcoin two weeks ago, uh, you have you have lost. A lot of money, and that's what a lot of people are trying to avoid, and that's why I, I think they're not spending Bitcoin as a means of payment. Uh, and finally, a turning point in monetary history, and also extinction level extinction level event for the old financial world order. So uh, we're gonna see how this is going to play out, of course, because they're not going to go down without a fight. We have seen this in the Bitcoin world. Um, but it's definitely going to be interesting to see how really rich, powerful, influential, um, essential for, for everyday life corporations um, deal with regulators and like, in order to create their own money. And yeah, this is just an example of how the United States Senate um, reacted to Libra, immediately they prepared a, uh, um, a letter to Mark Zuckerberg with I don't know how many questions that they want immediately answered. And uh, we, we hear this uh, coming from a number of governments, also European governments. Um, so yeah, definitely it's going to be very interesting. Going to the next one, Tether printing. I'm, I'm not sure what, why is this news. <laughs> it has been happening for so long. Uh, so much like Tether has been printed. Uh, some people also believe that this is one of the reasons why Tether, uh, why, why Bitcoin, the Bitcoin price is going up because there is massive demand by like China to actually buy Tether over the counter and then with that buy whatever they want, like uh, other cryptocurrencies on crypto-to-crypto -crypto only exchanges. And most probably, they're very, very interested in Bitcoin. And as we can see from the price, uh, there was actually one order of $62 million, uh, I think, today for buying Bitcoin. And I haven't seen such a large order for buying Bitcoin. I'm not sure if it's coming from the Chinese, but it's very, very possible. Um, and China, as you know, they tried to ban crypto, to, to ban, uh, to, to kind of slow down the, the whole uh, ICO bubble, and they kind of did, but the genie was out of the bottle, and a lot of Chinese are now very interested in crypto and trading crypto on a daily basis, using VPN services to access overseas exchanges. And um, generally, I think it's very, very hard to stop. Chinese people from getting crypto, especially having in mind that now there are also decentralized exchanges which use Tether um, and also you can exchange Tether for, for crypto there. Uh, the interesting thing, I'm not sure exactly why, why it's interesting, but it's created on Ethereum. And now there are two types of Tether, one is on Ethereum, one is on Bitcoin. And in this case, it's, um, it's pr printed on Ethereum. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly what the significance of that is. Uh, it wasn't very well explained in the news article that I read, but yeah, just so you know. <laughs> and then finally this thing, which is also doesn't look like big news to me, especially having in mind that yes, uh, Binance announced that they're going to ban U US citizens uh, from trading on their main platform on June 5th, 14th, but they also at the same time launched Binance.us, which is another 
like an exchange platform by Binance that's going to be serving especially US citizens and customers. So, I mean, it doesn't really sound like something that will like a, of a large significance because US, US traders will be, still will be able to uh, trade on Binance, but only on this US platform. So after, after, uh, after September 12th, all US citizens will not be able to trade on the main Binance platform. They'll be able to withdraw their money, to have access to their money there. Um, so they'll be just able to withdraw them and then put them on Binance.us and it's, it's done. I mean, you can, again, access Binance. So it's not a big, big news. I don't know why it was voted, but yeah, I mentioned that. And yes, what's happening with the price of Bitcoin? And now, yes, according to this chart, we are reaching all-time high. But just like notice that, like the when we organized the meetup uh, on, on this date, it was uh, it's not the like the really all-time high because it was twenty thousand uh, dollars. Here it was what eleven thousand dollars something. So now we are above that, uh, which is I uh, quite impressive. I would say quite impressive, especially having in mind how. Ether is doing um, this, this small thing here. Not very impressive and the general picture, as you know. Um, and, and that's it. That's, that's all that I have in terms of news for you. And now we can go to the naked truth about DLT. And having in mind like Facebook is kind of a DLT thing, I think it's, very, it's a very good time to, to talk about DLT. And we have three people from the um, Industria company in Bulgaria which are going to talk about DOT in these three specific areas. So pro document and process management, asset tokenization, and user experience. And this is big. I mean, not, not, that, not that the other ones are not big, but user experience for blockchains and also DOT is super, super important. So I'm going to give the word to Christo, who will start with the first presentation. OK, hi, everyone. Um, I don't remember my words, so try to ask as many questions as possible. Try to interrupt me at any moment <laughs> so in, in order not to finish that, that fast. Um, what do you know? Did I do that? Sorry. Um, do you know about Corda? Do you know what, what Corda is? OK, so I have to, to present uh, something about Corda. Uh, how many of you are developers here? OK, sorry. My presentation is very short. Okay, um, Corda is a DLT system. It's not a real blockchain. Sorry for saying that. Corda is uh, much like email. Um, email based on established technologies that we use nowadays. Technologies that uh, uh, were tested uh, during the times, not like Ethereum and everything uh, around that ecosystem. And uh, Corda is an enterprise-focused system. So the idea behind Corda is uh, to be uh, something that the business can appreciate, the business can use, and uh, that's the main goal, and I think that they're achieving that, uh, especially compared to the main competitor, which is uh, Hyperledger Fabric. And let's go back to the topic. Uh, document and process management has always been a difficult and um, time-consuming task. Many industries even today use uh, slow and unreliable and uh, very inefficient ways of communicating and transferring data, just like uh, sending attachments via email. And uh, DOT and Cord in particular are here to solve that problem. I can even say to revol revolutionize it. Um, while most blockchain platforms uh, focus on transferring the ownership of assets, okay, still no presentation. I've never seen my slides yet, so. I know I don't need them. <laughs> um, While well, the most of blockchains are trying to transfer assets, uh, DOT and of course Corda in particular are trying to uh, establish establish a system of uh, common knowledge, of common ledger um, that uh, is managed by the system. And um, this is why Corda introduced the concept of flows. The idea behind flow is to manage the agreement, the process of, of getting to an agreement, of updating the ledger. And um, 
the point of the force is uh, to organize that process and everything uh, to be done, all the communication to be uh, part of the, within the context of this force. And um, in, in details, okay, people are leaving, sorry. <laughs> um, um, flows are here to uh, allow the business to automate their processes. You can do whatever you want in your flows. You can um, set up uh, all kinds of communication. You can uh, start the flow at any time. You can freeze it. You can uh, stop it. You can uh, pause it. And uh, generally, flows are very uh, fast, reliable, and efficient. Uh, they don't waste uh, system resources. Flows stop at the moment uh, they don't need to run. So um, when the transaction is passed to a counterparty in order to be validated, the flow stops. <laughs> Still no slides. And uh, this is why the, the business can implement a lot of their uh, functionalities, a lot of their business uh, processes without the need of uh, extra additional uh, and uh, expensive hardware. Um, nice. Almost there. I'm also almost there. <laughs> yeah. Um, what about the flows? Uh, Corda uh, uses uh, Java and Kotlin. Everything runs on a uh, Java virtual machine. Of course, you can use uh, um, Grails. No need to do that. Um, you can see a standard picture of flow. Uh, you can um, do whatever you need in your flow. You can uh, gather, it's not visible here from the from the flowchart, but uh, you can uh, gather external data from a uh, service like Oracle. You can uh, process internal user data. And uh, once you're ready, you just pass the data, the, the flow, you send the transaction to the responder, and the flow is done. The flow stays uh, in a suspended mode and waits in, um, in, inside the checkpoint uh, point until the responder commits its transaction back. And uh, that's the big um, advantage of the flows because you can run multiple, many multiple flows uh, simultaneously in parallel and you don't need to bother about uh, uh, using system resources. And um, another interesting topic, uh, another interesting feature of Corda is uh, the ability to send attachments. Yeah, it's not a big deal, but uh, in a system that can be used by the business, uh, sending an attachment is uh, very important, especially when uh, the business process uh, requires that, when sending uh, files is a must. Attachments in Corda uh, can be a zip archive or uh, jar, signed jar files, which usually contains uh, other files. These are files that need to be shared between uh, the other participants, and they can be shared multiple times. Um, usually these files contain uh, data like um, a calendar of business days, uh, some uh, additional details, uh, some contract data. And this is, this is important uh, when you need to validate the actual data, the actual uh, processes that the code explains, because you can also provide a, a written contract that explains what's being done actually there. And um, once uh, uh, an attachment is being shared within the um, a transaction, it is already stored in the local storage of the user. So when the same transaction is referenced in another, uh, the same attachment is referenced in another transaction, there is no need to be transferred back uh, via the, um, the network. It can be just taken from the, from the local storage. And this is, this is a huge advancement, 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 advantage, sorry, <laughs> uh, because uh, we spent uh, less time networking and more time uh, in actually processing and validating the contracts. And with these two um, uh, concepts, the concept of uh, flows and attachments, Corda and, uh, allows us to automate a lot of business processes uh, in a fully decentralized DLT manner. That's it. Yeah? Thank you. Uh, two questions. First question, uh, whether Corda is free to use? I mean, do, do you have to pay license to use it? Yeah, there are two. Uh, uh, okay. Just throw the 
<laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, there are two versions of Corda, the R3, the consortium that is working on Corda. They have uh, a Corda open source, which is completely open source. I have many contributions there. Uh, it can be used for free. You can uh, set up your own network. You can use uh, the, the open Corda network. And uh, the second version is Corda Enterprise. You have to pay for it, but you have um, enterprise support and uh, you can uh, get advantage of some additional features like the firewall and uh, other um, improvements, uh, mainly about uh, compatibility and uh, uh, making the, the system faster. And the second question is? Uh, and the second question is, uh, what, what is uh, the advantage of Corda in front of Hyperledger uh, uh, technology? I mean, the technology is all, all time running, but at the moment. Well, that, that's a common question, and usually I don't have the answer. Um, Corda is generally faster than Hyperledger because the idea of channels in Hyperledger, it means you establish your own blockchain within, uh, between uh, different participants. And in Corda, uh, the communication is uh, point to point. You communicate with, uh, with, all, with, all, with only the participants you need to, and uh, it's faster to uh, establish an agreement between them. And uh, also uh, in Corda, inside the flows, you can um, reuse a lot of the functionalities. You can um, um, nest the flows, you can um, organize them in different manners. So it's easier to use Corda when you need to establish, to develop something fast, something that runs fast, and it's easy to develop. So it's just like Python, <laughs> I can say. And um, yeah, that, that's, that's the main advantage. What's the point of having a, decentra a decentralized network and actually exchange something with just one person? So you sign it and then they verify it. What's the point of having a network for that instead of just saying, sending the public key and saying, hey, you can verify that I signed this and that's it. There's no point in a network here. Uh, well, there is actually something I, I forgot to say about Corda. Um, in Corda, there are notaries. These are uh, special nodes that verify that the transaction happened. Uh, the notaries, usually there are two types of notaries, a validating notary and non-validating notary. Most of the notaries are not validating. They do not see the actual date of the transaction. They only know that transaction happened and they uh, keep a record of the hashes of the transaction. And uh, using that, uh, once I, I transfer a state to you and then you want to do something with that state, with someone else, the notary is uh, the note responsible to validate that uh, you own that state. The changes that you are proposing uh, correspond to the original, the original state that uh, uh, was part of our transaction. And the idea of Corda is that you have notaries that can prove that, that keep a record of uh, all state changes. And uh, that's why usually a transaction is between two persons or multiple persons, but you can, in, uh, in standard case, it's just between two persons. But once you want to uh, transfer that data with somebody else, this is where Corda comes here. You can do that on Bitcoin. Yeah, but it's slower, much slower. Yeah, yeah, it's free. You, ju you just need to set up your own note, uh, a notary, and that's all. You need two participants and a note, that's all, and a, a notary note. Uh, you said the Corda is not a blockchain. Yeah. Uh, but it, so uh, I think everybody knows uh, blockchain is a DLT. Every blockchain is a DLT, but yeah, not no, every no, DLT no, is a blockchain. Yeah. So in this in this case, uh, you said you're using Ethereum. And I didn't say that. I, I just said that Corda is based on established technologies, while Ethereum is developing their own like solidity. Do, do you do you use hashes between the blocks? Do you use hashes between the blocks to verify them in there in in, this, in your nodes? You said there are no blocks in code. The node is just a server. Yeah, yeah. and no. So, w w what do you store on them on, on your nodes? H uh, two database. Uh, something like a Excel yeah, table. It's a normal, a normal but who verified and uh, secure it? You, you're the one responsible for validating your data. Okay. Uh, the, the only thing that Corda is responsible for, you, you, you need to trust the notary. Okay. And uh, once you send a transaction, the hash of the notary, of, of the transaction, uh, which is generated, generated by the value of the transaction, data of the transaction, 
is stored inside the notary. So the notary node is the one that validates that the data uh, was unchanged at the end. So the I, we don't have third part. Yeah, we don't, but but we have a notary. Yeah. Okay. There are three three nodes. Which is the corda? Yeah. Yeah. Party A and Party B and a notary that validates that the communication between Party A and B is trusted. What incentivizes the notary to keep running? What incentivizes the no notary to keep running if there if it's free? There's nothing free. Yeah, if if you uh, Corda as a code base is free, and if you need to if you want to establish your own Corda network, you need uh, your own notary. You have to provide the notary for the users of your network. Yeah, you can, but it's still slower. <laughs> I can say generate block 10, and I can generate blocks as many as I want. OK, do it. Can you focus on the use case? Do you have somebody using the documents? Corda? Yeah, Corda, Corda is already adopted by many um, enterprises, mainly in the financial um, industries. But I think Boitro is going to say more about that. Is that right? Yeah. So my name is Boicho. I guess you guys are respecting Petco, but he wasn't able to come today. Uh, I'll be talking about asset tokenization on DOT, uh, and more specifically, how this works best on our three Corda. Uh, now, can you, can I do this myself or? If you want. Yeah, uh, okay, well, I prefer. It doesn't work with this, so. Also, it doesn't work with Apple. No. Come on, man. But there was some idea for a phone or something to be used as a clicker. No, that's all right. Okay, so I won't. Uh, so, okay, that's fine. So let's start off with uh, who brought blockchain. Uh, that will be Bitcoin, and thanks to Bitcoin, this wonderful technology has been brought to us. Uh, four key points, which I guess businesses and people would be chasing for the next ten to thirty years. This is peer-to-peer -peer transfer value. That's just one person to another. No intermediary, no no fee, uh, no no actual time to wait. This is something. Like, oh, hi there. Yeah. So basically, this is something every business and every uh, transactional company will be chasing for the next years. Second thing, settlement time. No actual settlement time. It just happens in an instant. Again, something that people could benefit from and businesses could benefit from. Third thing is uh, global liquidity access. Now, basically, how it worked 50, 60 years ago, you could only trade within your country. Now, that makes it global. You could trade with anyone on the North Pole from here. So that's also uh, bringing inclusiveness to cash, digital cash, and also assets, which we'll talk about later. Uh, fourth, and I think this is quite important as well, is uh, the resilience of a blockchain system. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but blockchains, Bitcoin's blockchain downtime was about 14 hours for 10 years, right? Um, yeah, maybe. I'm sure Facebook had more downtime for the past two weeks. So that's, that's quite reliable. And with the DLT, we'd like to keep it up the same way. Uh, now, it all sounds great until business has come. Uh, when it comes to business, uh, the permissionless perspective is kind of struggling because different businesses are in different countries. Some of them are in multiple countries. And that brings uh, regulation, custody, post trade, and so many legal and uh, financial things that just cannot be left away. So, uh, Corder's R3's idea is basically to bring the benefits of blockchain and take them to an enterprise business. I mean, I know there's a lot of talks about disruption, but uh, come on, it's, there's lots of businesses, and we have to transfer uh, this technology to each and every level of trading, not just people but enterprises, governments, and even banks. So this is one of the co-founders of Corda, and uh, I, I fully agree with him. So what he's saying, that uh, he's saying that digital assets are uh, one of the most exciting, challenging, and ambitious aspects of blockchain we could get. And uh, this is not so far away. Um, you want me to go back? Want to take another one? OK. Uh, now, what Corda did is transfer the blockchain language to, to, to the enterprise language, which is, uh, believe it or not, is pretty hard. 
R3 uh, was formed with, between banks, businesses, and uh, regulators, countries, lawmakers. So it was done from the inside out. It was done, it started from the pain points, and then they built an ecosystem that should be working for all of those three. So I know you had a bit of an argument whether this is a blockchain or not. Uh, what I'm sure about is it has the charms of a blockchain, although from a technical perspective it may not be the same. So let's move forward. This is one of the reasons I already mentioned. Uh, I mean, if you sell something huge, if you sell stock, if you sell uh, a house or a shopping mall, or if you sell bonds, someone, someone has to approve, someone has to say he bought, he purchased, he sold. So, and this is, this is not something we like, it's something the countries require and something global law requires. So, in order to make a blockchain work for enterprises, they had to figure out a way to implement laws and regulations and custodians onto the blockchain. So basically that's what they did for the last five years. And if I have to be honest, there's lots of clients and it's already working pretty well. It's basically making real world trade replicated into the digital world and digital assets are basically the final step or maybe not the final, we'll see where, where it goes. Um, now, Corda has two versions. It's enterprise blockchain and the one Christo told you. Enterprise blockchain, to be honest, is not for free. It's not as expensive, but it brings, again, uh, the, the law making, the regulation part. It's more serious and it's actually tailored for enterprises, but we'll talk about it later. So this is, this is a pretty old graph. It's like two, two, months, old, two months old, but uh, Libra, Libra should be here. Like, it, Libra is missing. Imagine Libra being here. And as Vladi said, it's, um, it's a kind of a DLT because the nodes are the companies who are taking part in the partnership. And um, this, this would bring a lot of value. And what I personally believe is that it's not going to be regulation or Libra. They'll meet halfway. You know what happened to Second World War, so we always meet halfway. It's never, it's never too much on the north or too much on the south. But uh, what was the whole idea? First, we had the blockchain revolution. We had the cryptocurrency revolution. Uh, then we saw that it was, it was, it's useful, but it's, it has its randomness, which is kind of hard to regulate. It has its permissionless, which is impossible for a business because you have to know who's trading on the other side. Then we had companies like Hyperledger and Corda, which kind of transferred blockchain to an enterprise language. And now what people are trying to do and what we're trying in industry to teach businesses is that they could take their assets in a legal way and offer them as a digital asset. And uh, later on I'll explain how much flexibility this could bring to a business. Of course, that's a very complex process. Uh, we already have clients who started it, but it's just um, imagine like, it's, it's like, it's like three, three different parties. You have the banks, you have the enterprises, and then you have, uh, you have the government. And they, I could say somewhere they work together, but it takes time. But it's, it's, it's really amazing. It's, it's actually happening. And then, uh, by the way, Libra's group, so they have to try, and I think they're moving forward. So the tokens that have been mostly mentioned lately are the asset-backed tokens. It's basically a digital token which represents physical value. Let's say you have a, you have a factory for chairs. So you, sh you have 300 chairs, so you issue 300 tokens. So whenever you trade, if you trade three tokens, if someone buys from you, they, they correspond to three chairs. This is real backed asset, and it's, it's really simple. It's very reliable. It, it really corresponds to something from real life. This could be energy. This could be the pens in your office, as long as they're not stolen. Uh, then you have the native tokens, which is uh, they're simply on the ledger, and their value is purely digital. And this is where they become volatile because you know about the scams, you know about, you know about everything. Uh, when it goes digital, regula regulators tend to, I don't know whether they close their eyes or they're too old or they're currently evolving, but it just takes time for them to get to know how digital life works. So that's, that's the main difference. This is real assets and this is purely digital assets and the real assets in the asset backed tokens are represented online, which is great. Um, what you can see here is basically, and um, I've always believed that we should fix the now, 
rather than fix the now from 10 years. And uh, I'd love a revolution, but what we could do now is help businesses digitize, trade online, not go bankrupt, talk to banks, get uh, governments talk to banks, get all of them talk together, because at the end of the day, whether it should be an end user or an enterprise, we should make it work. So bridging the gap is more important than totally disrupting everything. And I believe that's, that's what's about to happen with Libra. They'll, they'll definitely meet somewhere and it's, it's going to work. Because people need space and most of the markets have no space nor they have liquidity. Um, there's numerous new use cases. Uh, I've, I've, I've missed out on, uh, I've probably missed out on insurance, but insurance is not tokenizing yet. But what I've missed out on the first, uh, the first slide is that what I simply do in industry and what most DOT representatives and consultants do is take a process and optimize it in a blockchain inspired way. So with real estate, you know, that's, that's a topic here in Bulgaria. And if you'd like to buy or invest, you have to talk to a sales guy who's going to talk to a sales guy, who's going to talk to a broker, who's probably going to talk to the owners. And you never know what's going on. And this is a process of about one to three months. So um, just like Christo said, we could include uh, legal entities on Corda. So there could be three companies as notes. Another note could be a lawyer. Another could be a notary. And um, when we back real estate with digital assets, once we trade with real estate, first there will be proof that we did it. Uh, just like in blockchain, this would stay there forever. I know it's just between you and the one buying, but it's still there. It could never be erased. So from a legal perspective, it couldn't be better. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's it's, it's all there, and then it's uh, it's it's very easy. I mean, it's you shouldn't you shouldn't revolutionize the whole process. You just have to mirror it in a digital manner. So basically, uh, what could happen here, and it's already happening, I think, in Kazakhstan, they have a real estate project. But uh, first, first comes the global thing, which was already done on blockchain, on Bitcoin's blockchain. Uh, if I have money here, I could invest in real estate on the North Pole. So more liquidity for the people who would like to build a mall, a ski resort, more people investing, transparent way, full record, and an open market. And I'm sure there's business owners here, and uh, they'd like to go this way. Uh, could be Corda, could be not, but it's just a great way to, to bring liquidity to a very slow, very slow market. Um, another thing that has to be noted here, uh, if you have a real estate, uh, four or five people could jump with some money. If you tokenize it, a thousand people could invest somewhere. And since this is legally binding because of Corda's nature, a thousand people could get their equal profit. So that's, that's an open market, and I believe that's one of blockchain's gospels, right? So another, another use case, very, uh, it's a hot topic right now, it's corporate bonds. Now, when an enterprise needs to raise cash, they issue bonds. They need R&D, they issue bonds, they need, uh, they need uh, outsourcing, they issue bonds. But if it's a steady growth company, let's say, two, let's say 3% three, three per year, uh, again, they remain liquid. It's just, why, why would you buy it? And there's so many thousands, thousands and thousands of bonds, so it's kind of hard to find the correct one. And you know, I'm sure you already know that there's lots of exchanges, lots of different markets for bonds. So if you're trying to find a particular one, they're not in the whole ecosystem, so you might end up not, never finding the correct bond you'd like to buy. So imagine, again, tokenizing those, putting them in an ecosystem on the blockchain front end, which uh, Kalina will talk about later. You could filter, you could find the correct bond, let's say you'd like green energy or uh, real estate or whatever. You could filter and you could have access to more bonds. So this could raise more cash for enterprises and this could give you guys more access to uh, high quality bonds. So again, very simple way, no infrastructure required, just just a bit, bit of knowledge and more companies like ours. So on to the next one. Okay, so what's, 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 what's special about, uh, why, why do all of this on Corda? That's, uh, that, that will be your question, I guess. So this is, uh, this is the legal side, settlement finality. Uh, if, if I sell a flat, 
uh, and uh, I, I mean, someone has to say that I did it, someone has to say uh, for how much tokens or money I did it, and uh, this has to stay somewhere, and we, we need a custodian, just like Vlad said, uh, Facebook needs a custodian, Libra needs a custodian, people need rules. I agree, we have too many of them, but here, when it comes to big values, uh, assets, we really need someone to say it was done. We need a, uh, a witness. So this is because it was done by regulators, banks and companies, this is already set up on Corda, so it's easy to do. Identity layer is probably the part where people think this has nothing to do with blockchain, because it's not anonymous and it's not permissionless. But, uh, uh, you could agree you'd like to know who you're trading for tens of thousands of millions of dollars with. And this has to be recorded because if there's a... If you go to court, someone has to say who did it. So this is also a core, a core uh, function of Corda. Uh, another thing is the interoperability, and I think this is something other DOTs um, do not have available, but this is something history will be able to confirm. But uh, different types of assets could be traded on Corda. So if you tokenize on different things, you could still unite them in the ecosystem and still trade in between. And this is, this is very complex, but it's already happening in insurance, I guess. And uh, another thing is the digital exchanges, which we have thousands of. And they could also become a node. They could also tokenize on their value without much effort and still be a part of an ecosystem that Corda provides. So basically tokenizing everything, uh, if you simply put it in a legal way, if it's not stolen money or stolen real estate, could be done in a universal way. And last but not least is the performance, where compared to a Bitcoin blockchain, uh, this, is the, this is the New York Depository, by the way, DTCC. They did a report a few months ago. So uh, at highest peaks of trading volumes, uh, that's yeah, that's 6,000 trades per second. Cord is doing pretty well. So if too many markets go on the same branch, I think it could handle it. So that's pretty much, pretty much it. I just wanted to share with you before before I go. I'm currently working on a project with uh, lots of participants. It's basically two or three companies involved. I cannot share the name of the client, unfortunately. But uh, in a DOT manner, I mean, you have, you have a few participants. They're not in the same company. They don't trust each other, and they don't trust the centralized system. So where, where we come? Uh, we do a note for each and every one. Of course, we have a custodian who's going to witness everything. Uh, and they know who they're trading with. Everything is recorded. And this is where trust begins. And this is uh, the process consists of three contracts, a few forms, and maybe 15 emails. And for this particular company, this takes about one to five months. And that's ridiculous. And that, that whole thing does not sound like a transaction, but it is a transaction of information. So by making a note for each and every one of them, they gain trust. Once they gain trust, they gain creativity. Once they gain creativity, they could digitize, like I said, the pants, the remote control, anything. Uh, once, they digit, uh, once they have digital assets, they could expand. So it's, it's a never-ending uh, scaling process, and this is just the beginning. So if any of you have any questions, I'd love to, I'd love to have a chat afterwards or right after the presentation. Thank you. I actually have one question. What I what I don't understand actually is is Corda a network, or is it um, some kind of a, a like a I don't know a platform that is customized for each an individual client. So if I come, I cr you create for me one specific network that I can use with I don't know my my other subsidiaries around the world, uh, and this is one private network for for me and my my buddies. Or is it like a, 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 a network of companies? Uh, for example, if I have, if I use Corda for my personal thing, then I can easily connect with other people on the network. So I, this is what I, I, I don't understand. Uh, but, uh, we have the Corda network, so it's actually both. So we could do a bespoke thing for a client where they go private, they go between three companies, but we have the Corda network, which is pretty similar to Libra. So you have a, a whole ecosystem, and it's, it's basically like internet. Once they're in the ecosystem, they do apps inside, and it happens all inside. So it's, it's both ways, to be honest, but Chris should be able to confirm. Yeah. Can you confirm? Yeah. Okay, so I'm not lying, so although I do sales. <laughs> 
I come up with, with a standard for, I don't know, insurance, and I create this standard because this is what I want for my business case. Um, can this insurance, like how are other companies who do also insurance understand my standard? Because it's kind of for me, like it, it, for me it sounds a bit like everybody creates whatever they want, customizing their own way, which is nice. But then it's maybe harder to, to communicate between each other for, this, for the same thing. It's like for insurance, for example. Uh, in Corda, you have Corda apps. These are specific apps for a specific pur purpose. And uh, for example, for the insurance companies, if you write a Corda app that is um, especially designed for the insurance companies, and all the insurance companies in the network are downloading and using the same app, you can communicate freely within, within the network. So if you have Messenger, you can communicate with other people that are using Messenger. If you have WhatsApp, you communicate with other people that are using WhatsApp. Yeah. So the point is, if you, if you have a, a Corda app that you trust and use it, it's okay to communicate with other people that are using the same app. Okay, so, so if I want to do insurance, I need to use the, the specific DAP, which is used for insurance, in order to be able to communicate with other people. But if I don't want to do, use that, I can create my own app for insurance and then share it with you. So, so there could, so could be like 100 different insurance apps, so to say. Okay, all right. That's why business-wise, what they do is talk to the uh, US government, uh, UK government. They try and comply as much as possible. So when it comes to standardizing, they'll be ready for it. So we'll see who comes first, because Libra is pretty scary. Yeah. But, but I, I guess they'll do the same. I mean, it's, it's going to be making regulation bend over the business rather than go the other way around. But this, but this is what Corda has been doing, basically. Mm -hmm. They got the banks, they got the regulators, and said, hey, what, what you guys do and what we do, let's comply. Any more questions? Uh, just, just a comment okay. or a question. But well, I'm not sure that you'll be able to answer that, but why didn't Libra use Corda or Hyperledger and they decided to do, uh, to do it on their own? Uh, yeah, because like... Yeah. I'm, sure I'm pretty sure Amazon will probably follow and Google would follow and they do their own thing. Yeah, because yeah, obviously they haven't joined, so I'm, I'm sure they'll come up with something. I think, I think it's a very good idea for you two guys to go and like tell them, like and tell Google. Or, or change jobs. You see Facebook, what Facebook's doing? We can do that for you guys, <laughs> something like this. Hey, thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, just a quick question regarding universal interoperability. Uh, you, you talked a lot about digital assets and asset tokenization. So I was just wondering, um, any of these uh, real estate or bond use cases, um, um, what is the plan for trading them on a digital asset exchange, which many of people are building, or is it some kind of a private network within the Corda system? That's, that's what I, I, was, I was saying. It, it could be done there. Or if you already have the exchange, the exchange could be a node, so this could be transferred. So there's, if you have something like a legacy system or you already have something done, this could be transferred, and that's the whole point. It's one of the best use cases accorded, to be honest, because you don't have to set something up over or leave something behind. could be transferred. That's why different assets could be used, because different exchanges would probably have different assets. They could be concerning different art markets, so it's interoperable mostly in this way. Any other questions? Uh, okay, so thank you for the presentation. And I'm wondering about the role of the custodian. Uh, you said that, yeah, we're gonna find a custodian. Uh, who, who's, um, who's usually a custodian in this case? Uh, it, it, was, it was one of the examples, but most of the, let, let's talk uh, the developed world, right? So we're not going to talk about Bulgaria. But uh, the, the New York depositories would be, would be the case who says, hey, this was done. We have the record. And uh, it's, it's usually something, because in America, they're, they're, um, they're a corporation, and they sit between businesses and the government. It depends on the country, but it's usually something like a government body a lawyer, like I said, a notary. So it's, it, should be, it should be a legal entity, in, in my view. But it, based on the use case, could be something different. Okay. 
how long have you been working at Quarter? Uh, I'm on about four months. Okay. So the question is, um, how many like clients of Quarter are actually using it in production as opposed to, um, let's say, running some sort of use case test scenario? Because that, that's what I hear when people are in the sort of the enterprise blockchain space or DLT space. There's a zillion companies who are like doing little tests, but uh, there's not so many people actually using it. So just wondering what your experience has been on that. Um, that's a great question. I was expecting this one. Uh, if we share them by industry, um, real estate is still pretty, uh, it's decentralized, but not in a technological way, but you know how real estate works. But if we talk insurance, uh, I, I, I would lie if I say less than 60 or 70% in Europe's insurers are already uh, moving to Corda or experimenting or they, they kind of some processes are already there, some are not. But uh, if you know, uh, do you know what DNO is? It's uh, DNO is in insurance. A DNO is a very specific type of insurance policy where uh, you kind of insure your managers and your directors. If they get sued or if they make a mistake and another company sues you because of their mistake, that's a very specific enterprise insurance. So most of the DNOs are going uh, Corda. Yeah, so in terms of insurance, it's going pretty well. The rest depends depends on the use case. But we have some uh, stable use cases. I'll, I could leave a card with you and I could share some information with you. Any more? Um, maybe I have one. Okay, go for it. Before we go to the... Yeah, let's, let's do the next one. I'll have, yeah. Let's do the next presentation. User experience, actually, uh, when it comes to Libra, this is what was mentioned like in, in numerous places, that Facebook really knows how to do user experience, how to make addictive apps. And this is what will most probably will be moved to also Libra. And they'll make it very user friendly, and very easy to use on a global scale. Okay, should I, should I ask my question? <laughs> Maybe for, no, no, it's fine. No, 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 it's fine, it's fine. It was a quarter, it was a quarter. Like, like in terms of security, because Bitcoin and the other cryptocurrencies are secured by this massive amounts of hashing power. Uh, how is the security happening in the in quarter? For example, if, if the notary node is attacked, or can it be DDoSed? and then the transactions stop to be confirmed. Uh, like this aspect is interesting to me. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's just like any other server. You are the one responsible for maintaining your data and keeping it safe. So it's not Corda the one that is responsible for that. All right, so, it's, all right, so, like, so no innovation in terms of security. It's the old world garden model, so to say. Okay. Hi. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, hello everyone. I'm Kalina, and I'm the UX lead of Industrial. I've been designing uh, enterprise apps for the last six years, and today we will be sp we will be talking about UX design for blockchain and DOT for the enterprise. So, why UX matters? Well, first, let's see. That's what people see at the beginning. And first impressions really matter. And if we have negative experience, we will have uh, lost profits. And if we have positive UX, we will increase sales and revenue. Also, we will bring people back to the app, of course. Uh, and finally, we will establish blockchain as a respectable technology. Right now, uh, things, look, things look like this. Because <laughs> most of the guys <laughs> who are building blockchain uh, apps are super tech oriented. And they invite the UX guys later on uh, the process of building the app. 
So uh, my, uh, my advice here is get a UX guy at the beginning because he will ask the right questions and he will solve the solutions that you, uh, he will solve the problems that you didn't know were there. So is there any difference between standard UX and blockchain UX? Well, yes and no, because same principles apply to all fields of UX or design even, interior uh, product design and UX design. Uh, the key is empathy, but there are some differences because when we build uh, enterprise blockchain solutions, we have to focus on financial, uh, industries, uh, insurance, supply chain, and even government. So, our goals are to build and create transparency, security, and trust, and awareness. So, transparency means clear navigation and understandable information. Security, well, the different, there is different between, difference between feeling secure and being secure. And while blockchain, blockchain ensures security, many apps doesn't feel secure at all. And good UX increases trust not only in the system, but in other parties as well. And last but not least, fast learning curve and instant feedback uh, bring awareness. So. These are the key factors that we should focus on when building a uh, blockchain app. First, user types, roles in, uh, in user management, statuses and system feedback, states, event records, and audit. And we will go through all of this in the next slides. Okay. So first, there are user types. Different people have different mindsets and they require different interfaces for, for, from their app. Um, the example here is for, the first one is a high level bank manager uh, who would like to see a clean interface with lots of, lots of white space. Uh, easy to use, pretty simple. The second one is Forex Trader, for example, and she would like to see a very detailed screen with lots of, inf lots of information and tasks that are completed very fast. And the way to do that is personas. This is a tool created by Alan Cooper, and uh, he's a great UX guy. And what you do is uh, create an imaginary uh, user and build your app around, around him. You think of his needs, his wants, and his fears. And when you do that, uh, we, you go deeper because most blockchain apps will have different user types. Um, this is an example for a simple transactions app. Uh, and we have three different roles here. The first one is for the super user. So the super user will create another user. He will manage their accounts. He will be able to uh, make transactions, create uh, tokens or asset types or currencies or whatever and exit them and so on. The basic user uh, will be able to see his own account and be able to transfer his assets with another account. And finally, we have the regulatory, regulatory uh, who will be able to see uh, just basic information and uh, it would be in uh, read-only mode. Oh, skipped something, sorry. And my colleagues mentioned the notary and the oracle uh, services of Corda earlier, earlier. So the notary will verify transactions. In some use cases, you will need to provide a supervising interface for this one. And the oracle is the window of the system to the outside world. So you will need a interfa an interface for, for this also. Um, OK. And when you have all of these users, you will need to manage them. And uh, this is an example for t from True Data Share. This is a vir virtual data room uh, for M&As and uh, corporate document storage. So something simple, something easy to use is enough to manage your users. 
basically in most user management tools you will need those features so you will need to be able to invite users you you need setting and reviewing accounts grouping users and setting permissions and roles editing and deleting accounts and history of users actions aka uh, audit so this is again uh, example from true data share uh, tool that we've built and here you can see that all all, all the teams from the different companies can do different stuff with the with folder you can see the name up there you can invite more more teams or users and so on let's see what we've got here yeah and I think this is really important because it reminds us uh, that the purpose of the UI is to uh, help people and machines communicate and how we communicate what well, well with statuses and states and feedback so this is a pretty simple example of success pending and error uh, feedback from the system the first one is easy no need to comment there the second one is a pending pending status here we need to provide more details what is happening at the moment and how long it's going to take to complete and the final one is the error here we have to go deeper uh, except yes we have to provide information what what went wrong but we need to provide information and guidance for the next steps what should users do if this happens because oops something went wrong is just not an option here so here we have something interest interesting they this is a list of statuses in Corda flows so while this, the the process while the transactions is being uh, processed you will be the, it will be in some of these states and you have to provide information what is happening right now and the best way you can do is uh, using a progress tracker for example okay oh here are the states okay every UI, every UI needs states so the first one is easy user interaction states you have normal focus disabled and so on uh, the second one is empty states so if there is nothing in the system you have to provide information that there is nothing and how people can enter more information uh, you have to make good design for too much or too, li too, too little information and you have to make good loading states and your form, form validation should be great as, as well okay but what are the specifics in DLT and blockchain if we have a transactions uh, app, we need to make sure that addresses are easy to copy and they're understandable by humans. And if we have busy screens, we have to make sure that we, ho that we focus user, users' attention to the things that is happening now. For example, if we are filling out a form, we can dim the rest of the screen and focus them on the, the action if we have large data sets if we have big tables and charts and graphs we can uh, provide an option to expand or collapse this, uh, this kind of information and finally when we are filling out forms or uh, giving feedback to the system we have to be sure that confirmation comes before uh, sending the, the form okay and after we make all those transactions we have to make sure that we record them and show them uh, in a good way so we have to be very good at designing tables and graphs and charts so few quick tips for table design fixed headers always have help with uh, labels on top filtering options column sorting provide an option for bulk, bulk editing of course uh, for when okay that's an interesting one Man, uh, in many use cases uh, different ro different roles would be indexed so if you have reordering reordering option you have to change the index while while changing the uh, role number 
Okay? And for la large data sets, uh, there will probably be a horizontal scroll, so you should uh, freeze the first column. And finally, charts and graphs help the user to spot patterns and issues in aggregate. Come on, okay. And how we create all, those, all, all this information? Well, first, we have to have a, a good form, uh, and I think complex forms are easy to split, but simple forms are harder to split. And when taking crucial, crucial de decisions and making hard decisions, we have to split the forms into few sets, few steps, and here we can see the first step was enter receiver, so it's, there is the address, and the second one is enter transfer details. And here's the interesting thing, because in Corda you can have lots of different types of currencies, you can create any type of tokens, the, decimal, the number of decimal places for all of them could be different. So for Ethereum, I think there were 16, for blockchain, 18 now? 18, yeah. 18 or 16, okay. For uh, Bitcoin, eight, I think. And for uh, Euro, there are two. So you have to format your fields correctly. So you have to prepare that there could be a difference, okay? And after we, we filled out this field, we go to the next step, which is read-only view of the form, so we can provide the information in a, different, in a different perspective, so the user could be able to see if there is a, an, an error. And, oh, sorry. And finally, when we send the form, we should show what happened and what to be expected. All of this seems like a lot of work, it seems like it's very complicated in, and time consuming. And the solution that I found for, for me personally is to create a design system. It's something between um, a style guide and a pattern library. Uh, it has few different rules for uh, fonts and uh, colors. And it has some basic elements like buttons and forms and so on. And if you do it right, you will be able to scale your product really fast because if you want to change something, just pick some elements and make it work. Um, and if you want to build another product, if it's simple enough, you can just use it again, just change some, change some colors and so on. Finally, um, I want to say something about beauty and aesthetics. I know that uh, we are tech guys here and beauty is not our primary, prime concern, but uh, beauty is what, people, what makes people feel great. And design is made for people. So great aesthetics will make people love your product. It will increase the benefits, it will increase your sales, and um, a neat design will help increase sales and improve satisfaction. And this is a great book by a guy call, called Don, Don Norman. He's a UX guru also. And this is not just about UX, it's about everything in life. It's about how we live, how we uh, order, uh, how we make our home, how we make our uh, human connections. It's about everything in life and how beauty and functionality can live together in harmony. Okay, and if you want to go into detail of, um, for, of, into detail of what we were talking about, you can visit, this is the article uh, on the subject, and this is my blog here, so you can picture this, yeah. It has lots of details about tables, uh, forms, more pictures, more examples. Uh, yep, and that's it. All right. Thank if you, you have any questions. So was this that we saw, was it um, something that you guys have implemented already? Or is it a product for uh, someone, like for, com for a company, or? Oh, uh, those examples are from few different projects that we've been working on, and but you know we can't we can't show uh, the, the same 
UIs because, you know, NDAs and so on. But th those are extracts from our experience. All right, any questions here? That's perfect, perfectly explained. Okay, only any general final questions about Industria and Code Corda or DOT in general? All right then, I mean, thank you. Uh, oh. Sorry. <laughs> Um, thank you. <laughs> so, um, what I see the biggest problem with uh, with issuing tokens uh, is actually the regula regulatory. Um, how do you approach this in uh, in Bulgaria, in Europe? Uh, where is your main market, and uh, what is the what is your I don't know experience about? Uh, issuing uh, company tokens when there is no regulation about this? Well, uh, like I said, if, there's, uh, if there are such projects, they're in the developed world. So uh, any context about Bulgaria, Romania, or whatever, it's out of the question. Uh, real estate is already doing this. So um, in a way, um, of course, it's not requiring a new law. It's mimicking the physical law into a digital world. So, of course, you're right. There could be, sorry, there could be cases where a new law is required or a change is required. But it's um, like, like they say, it's baby steps. So, uh, some assets are easy to transfer into tokens. Some are not. Like, like I said, if it's um, if it's a dynamic company with dynamic assets, this could be. This could be complex, and uh, I think Facebook is on the same road. So we'll see where this goes. Uh, hypothetically, anything could be turned into a digital asset, but you're right, in a legal uh, perspective, this could be a struggle. But some of the assets which we're already selling and buying could easily be uh, put there, but not on our side of the world. Um, yeah, so this is actually an interesting question. Um, so I think what you guys are doing, you're not solving the regulatory issues. You are letting the clients solve the issues. You're just providing the infrastructure. Uh, well, uh, yes, we are. But then uh, if you sell uh, real estate in your city and you go into tokens, you could sell it global. So it's a kind of a liquidity issue that we're solving, but not a legal one. You're right. We're just bringing legal entities into into the digital world, but we're we're not actually a law company, and we're not uh, surveilling this process. Yes. Okay. Um, any other questions here? Ah, I, he, has there ever been like a security token or any type of ICO-like offering on Corda? Uh, ICO, no, but there, there is a security token. Like a security offer, uh, security token offering, STO. It's interesting because, like, it's, uh, it's usually, I mean, creating tokens. Uh, it's uh, you, you create tokens, you give them around to people. Has, I, I'm just wondering if, if if it has been done on Corda. Uh huh. Uh, when when uh, R3 and Cor Cordas emerged, because it was a few years of development, so when they emerged, uh, the ICO was kind of dead already. So they're, that's why that's why they put their effort there. And I guess if I guess Facebook has the smarter lawyers and smartest developers, so I guess they were on the right way. We'll see who goes there first. But it's it's more they wanna they wanna bring the physical into the digital, with, which kind of singles out security tokens and and ICOs. Yeah. All right. Any questions? Or if not, let's close this and let's thank take the, the thank the speakers from Industria for their presentation <laughs> presentations. And yes, uh, we I'm gonna see you guys hopefully next month. Next month is going to be the and actually the last Wednesday of the month. Next month is the last day of the month. So it's the it's always the last day of the, uh, it's the last Wednesday of the month, these oh. meetings. So, th the, sorry, it's always the last Wednesday of the month, but in this case, in July, it's the last day. So 31st of July, um, we'll share uh, what is going to be the topic soon. So thank you guys for coming and staying until the end. <laughs>
Good job. Thank you.